Um, thank you so much, uh, Shukinam and Srikamasa, for the uh, nice words. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Sheila Shiva Madam and the organizers of this program uh, for inviting me as a speaker. And uh, it's a great honor and privilege to stand in front of uh, my teachers. Most of the most of the faces I see on the dais are my teachers. So it's a great honor to uh, present my uh, topic, my research, uh, in front of them. So uh, I represent uh, now Government Medical College Kony. That's that beautiful building that you see. It's actually under construction. Uh, we are actually trying to get the recognition from uh, the National Medical Council. So we don't have students yet, uh, but. You know, uh, most of the seniors here know the difficulties that a newly set up college is facing, but I feel in the future that will be one of the best uh, institutions, I think so, because of the infrastructure that is being envisioned. I feel uh, this will not be the picture that you will see one decade afterwards. So we are currently in the initial phase of that, and uh, I represent that college. So uh, coming to the topic, air anatomy, I'm sure many of you are hearing what, what in the world is this air anatomy word. So let me, it is my job to first introduce what this thing is. Okay. So I begin from a real life experience I had uh, while I was teaching. Okay. I, uh, I was evaluating an examination paper, uh, 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 an answer paper, and a student, you know, everyone knows here the importance of, this is cavernous science, right? Cavernous science, it's a very commonly asked short note. And the student wrote an answer. Uh, the, the, the written part was pretty good, okay, but I've given him pass mark for that uh, question. But this was the picture that he uh, he drawn, the representative picture. And in that, can you see the mouse pointer? Yes. Uh, okay, I'll use this. Okay. Uh, everyone knows this is the cavernous sinus. This is pituitary gland. This is sphenoid sinus. And uh, these are the nerves, okay, the, they are labeled third nerve, fourth nerve, V1, V2, uh, sixth nerve, okay, and you can see an, an artery here, an artery here, an artery here, an artery here. And uh, that student wrote this as internal carotid artery, and that student wrote this as common carotid artery, okay, labeled it as common carotid artery. And I, I called that student and I asked him, why, why do you do this? I asked, that does common carotid artery reach the head? Uh, I told him, and then he said, yes, I, I'm sorry, this is external carotid artery. Okay, so all anatomists know what this is. And uh, and then I understood that he doesn't have a clue what this is. And I told him that this is internal carotid artery and this is also internal carotid artery. And then he is totally confused. How okay, can there be two internal carotid arteries on one side and two internal carotid arteries on the other side? I hope you can understand the, the, the situation. And what I do, when I come to this such, such a situation, what I do is, okay, I tell the student to picture uh, that this is a sphenoid sinus, okay, above that you have the pituitary gland. On both sides of the sphenoid sinus you have the cavernous sinus. Okay. The internal carotid artery will climb up the petrous temporal bone through the carotid canal. It will reach into the cranial fossa, it will go anteriorly. That is the cavernous part that you see below. It goes anteriorly, it winds up, it turns back, creating a 180 degree turn. This is, as all anatomists know, this is the carotid siphon. When you take a coronal section, you see two cuts of the internal carotid artery. One cut is in the cavernous sinus, and the next cut is above the cavernous sinus, which we call a supracavernous part, or there are different terminologies for that. But the point is, when I showed this, then he understood that the two, there are actually two sections of the same internal carotid artery. Okay. So what I did now is what I call as, or what our team calls as air anatomy. By the way, Ashwini Madam is my collaborator in this study. So uh, this is what we call as air anatomy. So the point is that I'm using a gesture, a hand gesture, right in the air, in front of me and in front of the students that I teach, to create an illustration to create an, uh, an imaginary mental model of that three-dimensional spatial structure. The point is that anatomy is spatial, it is three-dimensional. The matter that we teach is three-dimensional. And there are always limitations when we use a 2D picture. 
Okay, 2D picture has limitations. It is not that it is wrong. They have limitations in conveying the spatial content. Okay, so the one word that I will be using again and again today will be spatial thinking and spatial content. Okay, spatial content is something that we need to impart. It is doubtful whether we are actually testing spatial, spatial anatomy, spatial knowledge that much in the students. But that is ultimately one of the purposes of anatomy. If we need to know uh, anatomy from a surgical perspective or from a radiological perspective, from a clinical perspective, we need to have a spatial understanding of anatomy. That is very, very important. So that is the point where gesture, gestures, hand gestures can be a tool. Okay. So in air anatomy, what I use is I use a special type of gesture. I come to that what type of gesture that is. Along with gaze, I use to how I, I looked at the structure. Okay? And I make all my viewers or my students imagine that this is a sphenoid sinus. This is the pituitary gland. On the sides, I have cavernous sinus. It has so many nerves passing through it. An artery that goes like this and turns back. This is just one single example. I showed it because this was an actual experience of mine. But there are hundreds and hundreds of examples where these are clinically relevant, where we need to give a spatial understanding to understand a clinical phenomenon or a radiological view or a surgical aspect, a surgical approach. We need to give a spatial understanding of that. That is the aim of using what we call it as air anatomy. So this is a, a, an article that came in the uh, American Educator. Okay, American Educator. That's a, uh, it's titled as Picture This. Okay. Uh, in this, they say that it is very spatial thinking. Is, uh, as I said before, spatial thinking is very, very important in an educational perspective. Okay, uh, in this article, they say that we give focus. We, we all teach students or uh, we may have kids at our home. We, we give importance for language. We try to improve their language. We give tuition or whatever we can to improve their language skills. Okay. We give math skills. Maths is also very important. These two are considered to be two important things when we consider a, a scientific, uh, an increase in scientific perspective. But this article says that it is very important to create a mental picture of something. Okay. This article begins from the model of Albert Einstein. It said that Albert Einstein, uh, his account is there, I have highlighted that. He says that words or language as they are written or spoken do not seem to play any role in my mechanism of thought. He said that his, his thought mechanisms are not mainly conveyed through language. He, uh, many of you may know, he actually spoke late in his life. Okay, he spoke late. And after his death, his brain was actually studied by neuroscientists and they, uh, they have found that, that his parietal cortex is unusually large. It, that may be one of the causes that he is actually a spatial thinker. Okay? And this also says that many scientific discoveries in many fields of uh, science is actually made by spatial thinking. It will be very subtle, but it is actually made by spatial thinking. Examples that they have quoted are uh, Watson and Crick three-dimensional model of the DNA. Okay, how that uh, the helix is formed, how the molecules and nucleotides uh, interact with each other. All of them are three-dimensional, they are spatial. If you remember in your chemistry classes, you learned that Kekule has identified the benzene ring in a dream where he found that one snake was swallowing its own tail and that's how he, he got the answer of his you know, bugging question of identifying the benzene ring structure. Okay, just like that, I read that in this article itself, it's written, John Snow, the epidemiologist, the, uh, he actually found out that the cause of the pandemic of cholera, uh, of the epidemic in cholera at uh, London was actually caused when he, when he saw the spot map of cases. Okay, he got a London map, he got a spot map of cases and he tried to spatially think that this is actually matching with the uh, water supply of London city. And that's how he got the idea that this is actually spread through water. So even uh, an epidemiological, a health problem got the answer by a very subtle spatial thinking by that investigator. So spatial thinking is actually everywhere in our day to day life. When someone arranged this room, there was spatial thinking. When you negotiate a road, when you use Google Maps, you are using spatial thinking. Okay, spatial thinking is everywhere in our life. But some aspects of spatial thinking, if we focus more, we can make anatomy learning much more uh, interesting and enlightening for the students. That is how uh, this idea of using air anatomy evolved. So spatial ability of people can be tested, can be assessed, can be measured by scientifically tested and proven methods. This is one of such 
uh, a tool which we had used in our research uh, to study the spatial ability of students. Uh, this is something like a three-dimensional block model. Uh, what we play, when you, if you play Tetris video games, we use something like this. A, a thing falls from above. We turn that and we make it fall in a hole. Okay, that, so these type of models, we use them to ask the students questions. Which of these models are actually rotated models? Okay, this is one of the ways how spatial thinking can be measured. We have used this tool. That's why I added this slide here. This is another word that I use repeatedly. That is cognitive load. What is cognitive load? Cognitive load is actually our mental load when we learn something. There are three aspects of cognitive load. These terms may be complex, but I'll try to simplify it. Intrinsic load is basically the complexity of that topic. You cannot change the complexity of that topic. Okay? It will be like that itself. Okay? The, the load uh, that is intrinsic to that topic. It, it is dependent on the complexity of the, the inherent to that topic. It is also dependent on how much we already know. Okay, the intrinsic load will be higher for a primary school student than for a medical student. Okay, because medical student has learned a lot in the whole process of learning. So the, the previous knowledge of the medical student will be higher. So that is intrinsic load, which we cannot change much. Okay? But we can do uh, justice to two loads, the next two loads. One is extrinsic load and the next is germane load. Extrinsic load is the demands imposed on the learners by the instructional mode. What mode we use to deliver something makes the extrinsic load lesser. If we use an effective mode of teaching something, the extrinsic load will be less. Okay? And the next is germane load. Germane load is an instruction that helps to organize the process of information. So whatever we use for the student to help that student, his, him or her, to process the information better, that will increase the germane load. So an ideal instructional method Always keep in your mind if you are a medical educator, an ideal instructional method should decrease the extrinsic load, it should increase the germane load. Okay. So um, these are two variables that we, we explored in, uh, much in our research. Uh, this, is, uh, this slide shows different people and it shows that when people talk, they gesture. Okay. In the first picture you can see the uh, legendary Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, his speeches and you see how he gestures to give emphasis to what he say. Okay, much of his spirit is actually conveyed through his hands more than his words. Okay, maybe equally through his words and his hands. Next you can see an orchestra conductor using his baton and his hands to show he may use, sh use it to show uh, you know, the loudness or the brightness of a tone or the increase of pitch Okay. Uh, as Sir said, I am also interested in music, I am a classical dream musician. So I know how uh, hand gestures can be used to convey some aspect of music. Next is, you can convey an entire story through your hand gestures. Okay, you know how mime artists use their face and hands to convey something. You know how Kathakali, it, it, is, it just means you give the story through the play, Kathakali. Okay. So we are from a land where gestures are inherently used even in our art forms. The next uh, two pictures, first is Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is a theoretical physicist. He's one of the exemplary teachers of physics. You can search him in YouTube. And most of his uh, lectures, he used a lot of his hands. You can see in this representative picture. The next is uh, Dr. Thomas Nidish. I got the privilege to meet this person at, when I uh, had a training in London. And he is one of the unique radiologists, neuroradiologists, who do anatomy, who, who do brain cutting. You should actually see how he he, uh, you know, simplifies complex radiological issues, radiological patient cases with his understanding of anatomy, how he uses his hands to show. He, he literally does everything with his hands in this. Okay, uh, with his hands he can convey a lot of things that even clinical phenomenon and radiological phenomenon. And he's uh, one of the uh, giants in neuroradiology. This is the Dr. Thomas Snyder. So what I've seen on, in all this is the use of gestures to convey some content. It can be art, it can be music, it can be something academic. Okay, so there are a lot of things, it can be something social. So everywhere you see people using gestures to convey something. Now, uh, when we classify knowledge, when we come to cognitive science, knowledge is classified into two. One is primary knowledge and the next is secondary knowledge. Primary, biologically primary knowledge, a uh, gesture is an example for a biologically primary knowledge. And uh, sorry, uh, gesture is an example for a prime, biologically a primary knowledge. 
And uh, the biological primary knowledge has these features. It said that it is uh, easily and unconsciously acquired. Okay, they are easily and unconsciously acquired. That is, they are, the, the learners are not consciously understanding. The, I am understanding this concept due to like uh, due to the gesture. Okay, so that much ease it has. It is intuitive to our make, our biological make. Next is it has intrinsic motivation. When we teach something through a primary uh, knowledge uh, channel. The next is it has, it needs limited instruction. And working memory limitations are limited. As I said before, cognitive load will be better if we use gestures. These are four type of co-speed gestures. Much of this is done by the research by McNeil. And he, he described this in co-speed gestures in 1992. There are four co-speed gestures. Okay. Dialectic gesture. Uh, that word is complex, it just means pointing and tracing. Okay, suppose I want to sh you to show there are four types of post speed gestures. Okay, my index finger is used to used to guide your attention, the attention of my audience to that heading. Okay, so this is a pointing gesture. Okay, if I want to trace uh, trace the uh, this rope, okay, that that is all this together, pointing and tracing are together called dietic gestures. That is just number one. The next is iconic gestures. Iconic gestures is used to show relationships, it is used to show textures, it is used to show a feature. For example, I can say that this surface is flat. I can say uh, uh, the surface of a sphere is convex. Okay? I'm, I'm using my hands and uh, subtly changing its profile to show the convexity. So that is called iconic gesture. I want to say that this mic is superior to my laptop. Okay, It is above my laptop. This is an iconic gesture. So the, all these are called iconic gestures. So these two are the main gestures that I am focused on because my aim is to teach spatial anatomy. Okay, the other two types are called metaphoric gestures and beat gestures. What are metaphoric gestures? If I say that I want you to, uh, I am thinking something. Okay, when I when I do this, I am actually bringing a, an abstract thought in my mind. Okay, an abstract thought like I am thinking to to a picture to a to a. Uh, you know, physical gesture that is called metaphoric. It is basically conveying something abstract into a, a solid stuff, a solid, wish, uh, viewable phenomenon. That is called a metaphoric gesture. It's not something that I focus on. And the next is beat gesture, which is one of the most common gestures that people use. When I speak, if I move ha my hands rhythmically, that is called a beat gesture. So those two I will not be focusing, but the first two are the components of what I call as air anatomy. This is a, a, a wonderful study done in uh, our own country at uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Homi Baba Center for Science Education. I had got the privilege to interact uh, with uh, Jayasri Ramdas, Professor Jayasri Ramdas. She was a former dean of uh, Homi Baba Center. And there, they studied on how gestures can be used to teach elementary astronomy to science students. To science students. Uh, in that picture, they are showing how the globe is, how people uh, standing on the globe finds the directions, how the earth rotates, how the moon rotates around the earth, how the earth rotates around the sun, how seasons are formed, everything they were using gestures and they measured that, measured a lot of parameters on that and they showed the effectiveness of how much gestures can be a tool to teach science to students. Okay. So uh, they have done much more research, especially molecular biology, uh, teaching molecular biology and all of these they have done, their team has done. Uh, they have a visual cognitive, uh, gesture based visual and cognitive science team at uh, HBCSE. And in that uh, they have a, uh, this, this picture I, I, I took it from that, that article. They show that you have a phenomenon, uh, the, the above one is, you have a phenomenon over here. And that phenomenon needs to be conveyed to the students. Okay? So this is the teacher or uh, this is that phenomenon that is happening in science. And this is what the teacher, uh, the students should have in their mind. So they have diagrams. We all know the importance of diagrams. In our, even in our question paper, we have something written, draw diagrams were all necessary, right? And that had to be exams. Diagrams is very, very, they're very, very important. Uh, we convey a lot of things through diagrams. We also have concrete models. We have three-dimensional physical models. Most of the anatomy departments has physical models. So they, they too can be used to convey a mental model. But in this image, they are showing how much gesture is a, holding a central role in interacting with the concrete model and diagrams to convey and corroborate or increase the awareness of a mental model. The ultimate purpose is creating a mental model. 
So a gesture can be used to interact, to blend all these phenomena, concrete model and the diagrams to create the mental model in the uh, mind of the students. Uh, so that, that's a research by uh, Dr. Jayeshkar Amdas. Now, using body language when teaching is not a new thing. Uh, in this beautiful article, which you can download and read from, uh, it's by Hale et al. in 2017, they say that much of what we teach, okay, the, the rule is 7, 30, 8, 55 rule. Okay, is 7% of communication comes from words. Just look at the number, 7% is from the words that we teach. Okay. 38% is from the tone of our voice and 55% is from our body language. Okay? This was studied in 1971. It's a quote by Mayarabian in 1971. So when we take a lecture, we mostly focus on what is written on the PowerPoint. We mostly, uh, we, we are most, mostly uh, you know, focused on the content, the written content or the spoken words. But this is actually what is being, what is happening to the mind of the readers. 38% is from the tone of our voice and 55% from our body language. Much of the research that has occurred in body language says how much it is used to involve, how much it is showed to show enthusiasm, to control a class, for all these gestures are important. But our study mostly focused on the spatial kind of the fanatic. Now coming to the topic, what we, uh, now what we researched, what was our investigation, what was our experiment. These were the hypotheses why gestures are important. We hypothesize that it may be important in visual spatial memory. Through visual spatial memory, it has a role in motor memory. It is a primary knowledge, as I said before, so it should be easy to convey something using uh, air anatomy. There are uh, better cognitive loads. There should be better cognitive loads when we use gestures. The conception of a, uh, something or understanding of something should be better. There is room for interactivity. Always the teacher and the students can interact on an what I call as an air model. Okay. And the next is there is a room for enlivening the topic. I, I can actually live out the structure, the importance of the structure in front of my students. And obviously there is much economical advantage. You saw in the floor below a beautiful uh, virtual discussion table. I hope you ask the cost. Okay, so the economic advantage of using a gesture to convey something spatial and when you compare that with the current technology that is available to con uh, convey spatial knowledge, it has an enormous economical advantage, especially to places where, especially to, uh, in situations like our country, uh, where I know, uh, the, I'm from Pony, okay, so I know how much resource limited we are, so uh, this is something that we can use to convey something very valuable, spatial anatomy is very valuable, and this is something that we can use to uh, convey that. So, uh, error anatomy, these are some of the examples that I have included in my article and some, so, some, of, uh, some of my friends ask me, am I using error anatomy only for neuroanatomy? No. I can teach, I can use error anatomy to convey any component of anatomy with a spatial content. From neuroanatomy to gross anatomy to histology, anything with a spatial component, we can convey that, okay, They're using error anatomy model. So, this is uh, something that I used to share how heart chambers are oriented. Okay, the, in the first picture you can see the simple image that we often learn first in schools. This is the right atrium, this is the left atrium, this is the right ventricle, this is the left ventricle. This is something that we learn in school. This is called the Valentine heart. You can see the Valentine heart. Okay, that is a Valentine heart model. But this is not the human anatomical heart, we know that. The human anatomical heart is spatially transposed. These two hands are transposed in such a way, okay, like this. So, this is the simplicity by which simple solutions can be found for complex problems. Okay. So, this is another uh, way how I talk to these talents. Okay, the, I can show a midline like this. In my body, orientation is the midline. The two thalami are like two eggs. Okay, 
egg is an analogy, which everyone knows how an egg is shaped. It will be placed like this. The anterior end will be closer to the midline. The posterior end will be away from the midline, creating a V shape. The two uh, phenomena will be creating a V shape. The posterior end will be will be bulged. You can see uh, you can see the second image. Uh, the posterior end is bulged. The anterior end is narrow. Okay. See how my hands are getting formed to show the profile of the uh, thalamus. I can I can use the coronal section to show the nuclei. One of the common uh, exam topics is uh, the nuclei of uh, thalamus. I use this to teach the nuclei of. This is something in uh, in the axilla. Axilla is one of the first topics taught to students, where students are specially challenged for the first times in their lives. Okay, and uh, I can show that this is the left axilla. I can I can show that this is the left axilla. This is the humerus. This is the head of the humerus. Uh, this is these are the ribs creating the chest wall. This is the anterior wall. This is the posterior wall. This is the base, and this is the apex. So I can make the students imagine the pyramid right in front of me, not on the paper. Not on the 2D plane, but on the 3D space, I can make the students imagine the apex, the base, the medial wall, and the lateral wall. It makes the job very easy for me and for the students. Otherwise, students are going to spend hours to understand where the axilla. I know students who ask, "How can there be something in the axilla?" They, because their idea of axilla is the armpit. They are not understanding that there is a base and axilla is inside that. So there are a lot of hours that students actually waste. to understand spatial anatomy which we can convey with seconds okay that is the advantage economical advantage that i find with air anatomy now this is the experiment that we showed uh, in this experiment i chosen the topic of extraocular muscles which as you know is one of the spatially complex topics i used the first set of images uh, there are a lot of images there uh, this set of images i show to impart the idea of the orbital walls okay uh, these are the these beautiful hands are mine Okay, the, the, this is the lateral wall. This is the medial wall. This is the mid uh, of the orbit. This is the superior wall. This is the inferior wall. The roof and the floor. This is the base. This is the apex. In the next set of images, I am going to show the movements of the eyeball. This is the elevation and depression. This is the initial image that I make students imagine, and then I show elevation and depression. Then I show adduction and abduction. This much is okay. But next, we come to intorsion and extorsion, which is a complex, spatially complex phenomenon in which I show that this is the this is the uh, yeah this is the eyeball. This is the anterior posterior axis. If this is the twelve o'clock position of the cornea, this is intorsion and this is extorsion. Okay, this is intorsion and this is extorsion. I even found uh, uh, you know experts getting confused on inter intorsion and extorsion. So. Uh, these are some simple methods how we can show in uh, these complex phenomena, and this is much more complex where we are going to show the movement of muscles. This is the superior rectus. Superior rectus, as you know, has a primary action and a secondary action. When the eyeball is abducted, superior rectus will elevate. When the eyeball is abducted, the superior rectus is intorsion. Okay, this is something students will learn with mnemonics, which can be complex. Okay, they have to find out a mnemonic to remember the mnemonic. So. that become makes it complex so sp simple spatial uh, ideas i used to convey these things to them so this was a topic that uh, we selected and uh, this was the experiment that we did we asked for consent 94 participants consented we conducted a mental rotation test to assess the spatial ability of students we did a pre test we randomized the students to two groups uh, we used a block randomization method uh, a test group was lectured with air anatomy a post test was conducted the control group was lectured we has used a regular lecture i didn't use air anatomy gestures but i used beat gestures okay to make the control equal i, I cannot teach like this okay but i used beat gestures but i didn't use a space model i didn't use an air anatomy model so that the control group should be equal in all the way uh, when i compare with the test group except the fact that air anatomy model was used this is the standard for doing a, an rct that we learn Uh, in uh, epidemiology and then i took a feedback for gestures then i conducted the cognitive load test i mentioned what is cognitive load uh, then i also assessed how they interpreted the instructional method that is called an isq instructional skills questionnaire so these are the tools that i used and in the end i uh, i gave snacks and things for the participants and uh, this was the results these next two slides are the results pre test scores were comparable okay this is the control group we should just orient you to this this is the control group the median and the mean and the standard deviation this is the intervention group this is the p value okay i just want you to focus on this 
the pretest the p value is insignificant which means they their knowledge was comparable on both the groups in the post test we uh, we we conducted a, a series of questions which had basic recall which had imaging components which had clinical situations uh, which had uh, uh, clinical uh, phenomena functional phenomena questions on functional phenomena all this we included in the, uh, applied knowledge and this was the result of the test in the control group we had 76.2 mean and in the uh, intervention group we had a mean of 91.2 and the, it, uh, the control group uh, the applied knowledge was 42.7 in the intervention group it was 54 okay both of these were statistically significant next we measured the cognitive loads as i said before intrinsic load we cannot change there was no significant but extrinsic load there was a significant decrease you can see 1.3 extrinsic load reduced to 0.6 and it was statistically significant and the germane load from 24.4 increased to 28.1 that means students could this is a this is the measurable value of that students could organize the content better okay and that uh, this is using a standard tool cognitive load is measured using standard tools question as and uh, it was statistically significant next we rated the instructional method Uh, for two parameters how much it stimulated the student how much it was used to explain the content and both of them were statistically significant with a higher score so this was our main um, results and the next we also measured the mrt because mrt is mental rotation test that means we are measuring the spatial ability of students so we measured the spatial ability of students and we found out that students with moderate spatial ability okay this is a complex curve but this was asked by our reviewers to do this because this was most this was uh, doing justification to the analysis this is called the johnson neyman plot in this i just want to simplify what this is this is a regression line this is the mental rotation score and this is the post test score this shows that students with moderate spatial ability okay lesser spatial this are the higher spatial ability students this are the lower spatial ability students the lesser moderate spatial ability student had the most effect of improving their scores when they were used air anatomy to teach so the the uh, utilizers of our uh, the beneficiaries of our method of instruction were students with low to moderate spatial ability higher spatial ability they may be able to uh, construct mental models easily but lower to middle uh, spatial ability students uh, got became the best beneficiaries this is our team what we call our anatomy team uh, this is me this is dr nitin over here this is ashish ma'am uh, next we had uh, dr amok this is dr rakesh this is dr shantanu they were all medical students at the time and uh, dr amok i have to specifically mention mention his name because he was a house surgeon but with a very good research focus he made the most of the design of the study the the robustness of the design was done by dr amok he is now at that institute okay at that institute at that institute of fundamental research he is focused on uh, basic science research he is uh, now after that after his graduation and uh, this is our basic team uh, now after this uh, dr ashish b jaw he is uh, from tamil nadu he joined us uh, we are doing a second part uh, some of the psychological analysis of air anatomy and he is doing that and we are writing a paper on that and this is a a, a small youtube channel that i have where i have used some representative videos to convey things using special angles not a, not a huge channel just some videos are there uh, this was our publication which came in anatomical sciences education which is a journal of american association of anatomy air anatomy teaching complex spatial anatomy using uh, simple hand gestures and uh, this is published uh, last year we got the honor of being featured on the cover page of anatomical sciences education Uh, its impact factor is 6.6 is one of the highest impact factor journals in anatomy education and uh, it is ranked third in scientific discipline education and uh, thank you thank you. and uh, i'm really you know uh, this is a moment where i'm really proud that the name of my institution could come on the cover page of an international journal the department of anatomy at government medical college of bangalore so these are the two students and this is actually my students So this is not uh, some uh, someone have asked me did I invent or discover something I didn't do anything uh, like discovery or something what I did was something that we use a lot but I used it to define something like uh, what as what is air anatomy what are the specific components of air anatomy which we can use and streamline that to make anatomy teaching as 
effective, especially spatial anatomy teaching effective. So that is what we did. We just expanded what we know into something that can be utilized better to make spatial anatomy understanding better. So these are some other gesture based studies which I found very interesting and I have actually interacted with many of them uh, to improve my content. This is Digit Anatomy published by again an ASC by O et al. It's a Korean group. They used digits to convey something with spatial. But the limitation is that you may have to use this to convey things with branches or things which are more linear or this, things which has the formation which we can make with our hands and digits. Okay, so th they have shown here for the iota and branches. This is for anterior scaling, the scaling space. Uh, this is a thyrocervical artery, anterior scaling. Okay, uh, this is the inferior thyroid artery, all the branches of thyrocervical trunk. So, but the limitation is that you only have a few structures that can be shown with this. But this is something very interesting that they, they did. Now, this is a wonderful uh, article by Chan, Lapki Chan, Chinese uh, faculty. Uh, he used a low tech method and combined it with gestures to show gut rotation. Okay, you can see how a simple foregut, uh, midgut, uh, hindgut model, and he used that to create the physiological umbilical hernia. Can you see that? This is the physiological umbilical hernia, which we can use the uh, the gut is now herniating outwards, and then when it goes back, you can see how the transverse column is in front of the foregut part. So all this you, you can combine gestures with low tech models. Now, this is a uh, study that came in uh, Frontiers in Physical Psychology. Uh, this is by Sherdy et al. They used uh, embodied cognition to know uh, supination and pronation, to understand uh, supination and pronation. And this, what they did is they made students to gesture. It's not just instruction method. They used students to gesture. And when they used students to gesture, they found that the student's understanding is better. Okay. So this is a component with the, that we thought to include, but we thought it may become more complex because students may not be using their anatomy properly. Here the most important content is that I have a mental image and I am using my gestures to convey that mental image to the students. Okay, so uh, I didn't involve the students' mental image into this. Okay, but the, here they are using the students' mental images to, uh, to, measure the, uh, to conduct the study on the, uh, this aspect. Now, this is another interesting study where they have used the digits to show the semicircular canals orientation. Internal ears now a topic that is being taught, unlike before, okay, for anatomy. This is the superior semicircular canal and the anterior semicircular canal. This is the posterior semicircular canal, and they are orienting this to the midline. Okay, this is the midline, and they are orienting the superior semicircular canal, inferior semicircular canal, and the lateral semicircular canal uh, in this space. Okay, like, like this. This is superior semicircular canal, this is in uh, posterior semicircular canal, and this is the lateral semicircular canal. This is a completely a perfect example for a spatial structure in anatomy. And uh, you can use this to teach a lot in ENT. For example, uh, Fitz, Hall Pike, Maneuver, or uh, any of these, Vertigo, you can teach a lot using this. So, this is a, uh, something that came in uh, Arthes of Order and uh, Langeau. And this is some additional components of gesture. They have used three-dimensional uh, structures to be depicted using something called as uh, haptic visual observation method. This is by Ray et al. Uh, uh, we are actually collaborating. Uh, he's from South Africa. We are actually collaborating on a, another study. This is by Balamans who says that drawing, actual drawing, which is not perfectly gesture, but uh, he is using that to convey spatial content. That is by Balamans. So these are all uh, you know, ancillary structures of gestures, ancillary methods of gestures that you can use to improve understanding of anatomy. So take home points, don't limit your tools, okay, not just blackboard, not just powerpoint, not just something high tech, uh, but you can, you have a number of tools that is yet to be explored to teach. Always think out of the box. Educational research is very interesting and uh, listen to students, actually the, the you know, the, the the seed for doing this research came from student feedback. Students said that when I teach using this hand gestures in the air, they, they say, you teach in the air, that's what, there's that, that a word actually from students. So I got this idea, the spec, spark of this idea, but actually from the feedback of students. So always make it a point to listen to students. Form a research team. Uh, that team which I had was the most critical point how this uh, research came up because everyone in that team contributed so much. They were so vibrant. They contributed so much to the ideas. Every step was designed by, some component was designed by that team. 
always be open minded always be open minded to suggestions to novel ideas these are the take home points that i found which i wish to convey uh, it to uh, especially to post graduates who think of doing an educational research on uh, to make medical education better so it's a long list actually this doesn't end here a lot more names uh, the funding got by state sbmr state board of medical research uh, renuka madam who is, was my hod at that time she supported a lot for uh, doing this Uh, Dr. Uh, C. C. Karta, uh, Anish Sir, uh, Dr. Michael Horsch from uh, Michigan University, Dr. Michael Peters, who gave us the mental rotation method. That is a very, actually, a very confidential test because it is not in the online space. Because if you do mental rotation multiple times, your spatial ability will improve. So, if to test that, it should not be online. So, you have to contact Dr. Michael Peters directly to get the tool. Uh, Dr. Fayrus and Dr. Jay Prasad, they were the ophthalmology reviewers. They reviewed the content of that external extraocular muscle movements. All the images they were all provided by Dr. Fayrus and Dr. Jay Prasad. Umesh sir was uh, my teacher, and Dr. Amiya was our sir, and she is the one who made those uh, pyramid models, that graphic models. Everything was done by uh, she and Dr. Amog. Uh, there are a lot of people other than this who supported me for this. It was a huge. It, it took a lot of time. Uh, the batch was 2019 we got it published in 2022 the review itself took one year it was a long procedure very hectic we thought of dropping it many times uh, but we persevered a lot uh, i to thank ashwini madam especially uh, she was a big inspiration for me to do this and uh, we could come up with a good result and we are uh, we are thinking of advancing it forwards to make it more effective so thank you